Hello, I'm back again. Can you believe that? Well, I don't know about you, but what I said this morning was probably the hardest thing I ever had to say because it was so meaningful to me that I had to keep digging my nails into the palm of my hand so I could keep talking, so bear with me. Uh, this afternoon, I want to talk to you about something that's been troubling me for the last few years. I keep asking at the International Leadership Association and elsewhere, leadership for what? People talk about leadership ad nauseum. But what is the pur purpose of leadership? And I think that the real importance of leadership is grossly misunderstood. So Confucius said that the man who asks the question is a fool for a minute, but the man who does not ask a question is a fool for life. So taking Confucius's advice, let me ask, leadership for what purpose? Why, if at all, is leadership important? And why is the real importance of leadership so misunderstood? Through the ages, leadership scholars, uh, people in leadership roles, and those who have lived close to leaders have contributed both to our understanding and to our confusion about leadership. From the ancient uh, writings uh, of early philosophers to Carlyle's great man theory to Max Weber, those of you who've had me in class know I tell you, do not dare to die before you read Max Weber. Uh, Max Weber's tripartite description of charismatic, traditional, and legal and, uh, and rational authority, Hooke's hero in history, Greenleaf servant leadership, Burns's transformational leadership model, all of those have simply uh, bedeviled the human imagination. And more recently, concepts of adaptive leadership, leader-member exchange, authentic leadership, invisible leadership, and con even connective leadership. And I have to confess, I think I have been guilty in uh, contributing to, to this problem. And there seems to be no end in sight. Many of these pr approaches to leadership focus on the means that leaders take. Others focus on the personal characteristics of the leader, particularly and most regrettably on charisma. I once wrote a chapter in someone's book called A Pox on Charisma. And I know that Peter Drucker shared my disdain for, for, uh, for charisma, charisma by itself. Few, if any, of the existing leadership paradigms differentiate leadership in terms of the ends or the goals that leaders, together with their constituents, my students know I hate the word followers, identify as a worthy pursuit. And herein lies the basic misunderstanding of why and how leadership is important. In more recent years, I've begun to think that while different types of leadership strategies and approaches do matter greatly and in complex ways, it is the goal or the purpose of leadership that actually is of primary importance. By focusing on leaders personalities and the strategies they seek, we have, I think, mistakenly put the emphasis on the person or the means rather than the ends or the goals of leadership. Let me drill down on this for just a moment. We have, I think, misguidedly fixated on the traits of leaders, their persona, their personalities, um, and considerable scholarly and popular attention, too, has been directed toward ca leaders' charismatic glows, their exemplary characters, their great conquest, as well as, on occasion, their toxic attraction. We identify and measure the behaviors they tend to use 
or should use under different circumstances. In some of my own work, I realize I have contributed to this problem. While the person, the behaviors, and the implementation strategy of leaders are important to a full understanding of the leadership process. They are not the quintessential or the most important function of leadership. Rather, identifying a transformative purpose, a noble enterprise that changes the world for the better, is the true essence of leadership. And engaging others in this endeavor is an essential part of the leadership process. Otherwise, leaders are simply solo actors or Don Quixotes with perhaps a Sancho Panza or two in their thrall. We want to read about leaders, those who are long dead and those who are still living. I did a search on the web for uh, biographies of leaders. In less than one minute, in seconds, thousands of, uh, in fact, millions of, of citations came up. There were uh, hundreds of thousands of biographies and entries on Hitler, on Roosevelt, on Obama, on Trump. And we can learn something from biographies. I'm not against biographies, as I mentioned this morning with Boswell. Um, the critical issue is not what kind of leadership is best or even which leader is the most effective. Instead, the essential question should be leadership for what purpose? At the risk of sounding overly confident, I think the answer to the question, leadership for what purpose, is really rather simple, if not always readily apparent. The purpose of leadership is to identify an ennobling enterprise or goal that changes the world in some fundamental way that engages others in that noble effort and that creates meaning in the lives of those who join in that enterprise. That is, in the, in the life of the leader and the leader's collaborators. Uh, that noble enterprise often involves a moral imperative that takes dedication and sacrifice from everyone involved. Rarely is the task readily achieved. It may seem daunting, even unattainable. As civil rights activist Jesse Jackson understood, however, it should, and I quote, meet the moral challenge of the day. So it often remains elusive, waiting for some determined individual or group to issue a clarion call to address it. American former First Lady Rosalind Carter, a keen observer of leadership, suggested, a leader takes people where they want to go. A great leader takes people where they don't necessarily want to go, but ought to be. That, I think, is the crux of the issue, identifying where we ought to be, where we ought to go. Those difficult destinations, those meaningful missions, those ennobling enterprises are the goals that leaders in every arena and every era should identify and urge us to achieve. Then, then and only then, various leadership approaches that I have already alluded to are simply the means to those life-changing, planet-altering ends. In short, the goal is primary. The means, while still important, is secondary. In preparing this talk, you won't be surprised to know that I went back to consult some of Peter Drucker's writings. And in 2001, Peter wrote, and I quote, leadership does matter, but alas, it is something different from what is now touted under this label. Leadership is not by itself good or desirable, end of quote. As you can imagine, I was both elated, simultaneously elated and deflated, that way back in 2001, that Drucker wrote, 
quote, leadership to what end, is thus the crucial question. So as I might have guessed, Peter was there before most of the leadership experts. Yet, surprisingly, this Dracarian wisdom has been largely ignored. Only when we have identified the nature of the ennobling goal to which leaders should devote their own and their collaborators' efforts, should we concern ourselves with knowing what kind of leadership strategy to use and when to use it or when to use them? Only then does the question regarding which kind of leadership approach to use become crucial. That, and then and only then, do all the different leadership theories come into play and prove their value. Let's rethink leadership for a minute. Help me with this. Let me digress briefly just to tell you how I began to think in this you know, convoluted way. When I was invited to a multinational business conference in Nanjing in 2011, you may recall that we were still in the throes of a global economic turndown. And I was asked to discuss what could business do to address the crisis. Remembering Confucius's advice, I felt the question needed reframing to ask a different, larger, more relevant question. And that was, what can every sector, not just business, do to rescue the world? This demanded a global effort from every sector, from business to religion and everything in between. As a first step toward understanding that immense crisis, we needed to ask, how is the world spending its resources? Or we might more correctly consider, how is the world misspending its resources? While tourism was the largest global industry, many people are surprised by that, the defense industry is a close second. Nations determined to protect themselves from attack or engaged in open conflict were voting and even now continue to commit a significant portion of their economic resources to defense. Even as the world has tried to come to grips with the lingering economic malaise, the World Economic Forum reported that as recently as 2015, and I'm quoting, the economic impact of violence to the global economy was $13.6 trillion in terms of purchasing power parity. That is equivalent to $5 per day for every single person on this planet. Now, let's consider how the world's population is living. As recently as August 2016, with a population estimated by the UN at 7.5 billion, 3 billion people around the world were living on $2.50 a day or less, while more than 1.2 billion were living on less than $1.25 a day. And here we are, the world spending $5 a day uh, on war and the prevention of war. And let me digress for a minute. I was, uh, you know, really confused and astounded to realize that both in the last administration and this administration, we are proposing to use between three, one trillion and three trillion dollars on upgrading our nuclear defenses. But remember, we never intend to use them. If I said to this audience, um, we are going to spend three trillion dollars creating the most up-to-date, most technologically advanced uh, buildings on campuses throughout the world, but we're never going to let you use them. You would take me away to the nearest, you know, psychologist to have me, you know, examined, and you should. Okay. Um, Let's see, over 800 billion, over 800 million people worldwide do not have enough food to eat and three million children die from malnutrition each year. Approximately 1.2 billion people live without electricity. 
40 million children worldwide live without adequate shelter and more than 750 million people lack adequate access to, cleaning water, to clean drinking water. That $13.6 trillion of expenditures and losses represents 13.3% of the world GDP. Moreover, more than 70% of the economic impact of violence is mostly attributable to government spending on the military and internal security. The remaining 30% comes from, quote, the consequential losses from violence and conflict. Now, let's compare this to what we spend on peacekeeping, okay? In 2015 alone, UN peacekeeping expenditures represented only 1.1% of the 742 billion of economic losses from armed conflict. If we talk about not peacekeeping, but peace building, which I don't think we really know how to do, maybe that's why we have to spend so much, um, those, those expenditures totaled 6.8 billion, or 0.9% of the economic losses from conflict. So we're spending less than 1% on, of the, on peace building uh, compared to what we spend on, uh, on defense. Clearly, the world is not thriving financially, and certain regions and people of the world, as we just saw, are still living in abject poverty and misery. Still, their governments are spending resources on war, its prevention and or its conflict. Um, to put a different lens on, uh, on the problem, Funds spent on the military and homeland security do create jobs. However, an interesting fact, domestic spending on health, education, infrastructure, or clean energy create even more jobs. Investing $230 billion in war creates 1.6 million jobs, whereas investing the same amount in health care creates 3.2 million, twice as many jobs. So the, the jobs creation argument simply doesn't wash. And those were just US figures. Think about what the global figures would tell us to our collective shame. Um, so I began to think, how could we think about this differently? Well, one thought that occurred to me was, how about making the defense industry Nonprofit. Let that sink in for a minute. I wish the CEO of Boeing were here. One powerful way to address this problem is to move the defense industry from the for profit to the nonprofit column. Just for a moment, think about what would happen if every country made on a Friday afternoon, at four o'clock, made defense contracts nonprofit. Wouldn't that make the defense industry a truly patriotic sector? <laughs> and what if every country had a Department of Peace? And Benjamin Rusk, who was one of the founders, of, uh, one of our founding fathers, go on the web, you'll see this. He, he wrote a description of a Department of Peace and even described and, and designed the room where peace documents would be signed. But it, it's introduced at virtually every Congress and it is just totally voted down or doesn't even come for a vote. In my own thinking about these obscene expenditures on weapons of war, I have been inspired by the video of an Egyptian man who previously had uh, produced landmines. I watched him one night when I was in Sweden and I was jet lagged and I couldn't sleep and I turned this on. If anybody finds that video, please send it to me. I've searched and searched. He used to make landmines. Now he makes landmine detectors. And when he began to talk about landmine, his switch, you could see how his face changed. He now passes what Peter Drucker used to call the mirror test. Can you look in the mirror and be proud of what it is you do and who you are? 
Let me be clear, I'm not against making reasonable profit. Rather, I'm protesting how and, and on what that profit is made. If we think about the human costs of war, uh, the World Health Organization estimated in 2002 that violence caused more than 1.6 million deaths worldwide every year. And let's not forget, at that time, the total world population was 6.3. So 1.6 million out of 6.3, that's mind boggling. Since then, the world has also become awash in wars and terrorism. And I have all kinds of statistics from the Watson Institute at Brown uh, that for the US alone, over 370 people have died due to direct war violence and at least 800,000 more indirectly. 200,000 civilians have been killed as a result of the fighting at the hands of all parties to the conflict. The US federal price tag for the post 9-11 wars is about $4.8 trillion. Uh, and the wars have been accompanied by violations of human rights abroad and even here at home. And the wars did not result in any inclusive, transparent, and democratic governments in, uh, say, Iraq or Afghanistan. I think we have to be serious and question ourselves. What are we doing? What are we thinking? Despite fewer wars since 2008, the number of deaths worldwide has tripled. And the number of displaced persons exceeded uh, 50 million people in 2013. It's gone up since then. These are not... Um, these are not unimportant issues. These are things that you, as decision makers, as people who have control over resources, who make decisions every single day about how to spend money, what kinds of products to develop, what kinds of initiatives, initiatives to undertake, you need to think about this. Um, I could spend the rest of my time talking about this and the costs of terror, terrorism. Uh, the costs of terrorism are incredible. But the point is that leaders of the world's countries, not the average citizen, made those momentous and destructive decisions to allocate their resources to the goal of defense or preparation for or conduct of war. However you choose to frame it, many current world leaders identified and continue to identify war as a worthwhile goal. Following Confucius's advice, let me ask one more question. Why do the world's leaders focus on war rather than an ennobling goal to transform and enhance the world? There are many ennobling goals, and we could enumerate many, but peace beckons us as the queen of noble enterprises, and we shall turn away from that call at our own and the world's peril. Let's also remember that history will be our judge. So I mention it today to you, to this audience particularly, whose influence on thought and practice can be and is immense. As such, so is your responsibility. Consider this a serious call to peaceful arms. Since my own awakening, I've continued to think about and work on a comprehensive plan for peace and prosperity. It's called a Connective Leadership Strategy for Global Enduring and Sustainable Peace and Equitable, pros equitable Prosperity. I have linked peace and prosperity because I sincerely do not believe that we shall ever have peace if large segments of the world live in poverty. And this peace plan is conceived as, a, as open source. And what that means is that everyone, each and every one of you, is invited to go on the web and amend it, change it, update it, add new things to it. I beg of you to do that. It's, the web address is www.connectiveleadership.com. It's that simple. Uh, I think about peace not simply as, a, as an economic necessity, but as an ennobling enterprise as well. 
I think some people who know my work, my uh, concern about this would say I obsess about it. Uh, but I, I think about leadership for peace and I try to examine the reasons why world leaders have been unable to achieve world peace, why peace continues to be so elusive. And this also made me reconsider how I think about leadership and the role of leaders in identifying worthy goals, more noble enterprises for themselves and their collaborators. There are many ennobling enterprises, but I do believe that peace is the pinnacle of noble endeavors. Global peace, national and community peace, peace in the workplace, even peace in the family. Most other ennobling goals are hampered or impossible without it. In addition, equitable prosperity is the handmaiden of peace. For when only a small minority of the world's populations live in prosperity, while the rest struggle in varying degrees to exist, peace becomes an unreachable goal. Now I'm skipping a whole bunch because I'm aware of the time. But let's return to rethinking leadership. Only after leaders with their collaborators' help have identified the transformative goal, the noble enterprise that can change the world in a truly positive way, can we then actually understand how important leadership really is. Only then can we reduce our misunderstanding about the importance of leadership, not as an end in itself, not as something to be yearned for, sought after, uh, not as a role that we want, not as embodied in any one individual, but as the ultimate mechanism for identifying a transformative goal and then only then, providing both leaders and their collaborators with the appropriate strategies or means or vehicles, if you will, for enabling them to achieve this goal. Uh, and here is where we must recognize with both nuance and pragmatism the value of the different kinds of leadership and the leadership theories that I have been dissing as, as in this talk. Think about the value of different kinds of leadership for different goals and at different stages in the quest for a noble vision. So you see that there is, after all, some use for all those theories of leadership. To pursue this homegrown analogy, once the leaders and collaborators have jointly identified a transformative goal, leadership strategies then function like a fleet of vehicles, limousines, sedans, racing cars, uh, SUVs, each with its own purpose that can take us to different destinations, cope with different road and weather conditions. For example, which leadership vehicle is appropriate for reaching which goal and which leadership approaches or combinations thereof in which order or in which sequence are appropriate for each specific stage in achieving that particular ennobling enterprise. Uh, to oversimplify, if my goal is to attend a state dinner at the White House, should I arrive in a truck or a limousine? Should I use a race car or an SUV uh, or a limousine to drive up a mountain trail? In other words, different leadership approaches, sometimes in different combinations, must be utilized with skill and nuance for each stage of the leadership journey. Selecting and using the appropriate leadership strategy or strategies for each goal as well as for each stage in, in reaching that target are what makes leadership, not leaders per se, important. In fact, that combined with identifying an ennobling goal is the true but often misunderstood importance of leadership. Important, uh, of leadership. How am I doing for time? Well, no one knows. I'll keep going. <laughs> okay, so let's play this out for a moment, okay? Um, 
connective leadership, which some of you will know, I believe, is the best vehicle when the goal is to bring together diverse but interdependent groups with potentially conflicting agendas, serves that purpose. Adaptive leadership, Heifetz's work, provides the most appropriate uh, vehicle when, in the pursuit of an ennobling enterprise, a collaborator is stymied by a task that's never been done before. Then, that's the point at which the leader has to create and hold what Heifetz calls a safe place in which the collaborators and the leader have the opportunity to figure out how to make it happen, as Cleopatra once said, make it happen. Servant leadership, Greenleaf's, Greenleaf's idea, is called for when the leader understands that attending to the needs of the constituents will result in their reciprocating with increased engagement, teamwork, and performance. Transformational leadership, Burns' work, is required when collaborators and their leaders recognize the need for change that will also demand a moral transformation in both the collaborators and the leaders. Leadership strategies are simply the means applied appropriately, adaptively, and authentically that must be utilized at each stage of the journey to reach that transformational goal. We need to know what kind of leadership to use for what, when, and what combinations. Still, the ennobling enterprise, the goal, is always paramount. To sum up, the identification or articulation of an ennobling transformative goal is the misunderstood but primary importance of leadership. That is what Peter Drucker was talking about. Then, and only then, leadership strategies or the various approaches in many appropriate forms described by all the different para leadership paradigms I've mentioned and others besides, used under different circumstances, provide the means or the vehicle for reaching it. In closing, let me add just one last thought. Occasionally, occasionally, in the course of human events, a transformative goal moves through three stages. From first, improbable fantasy, and maybe that's where we are today, to insistent focus, to inevitable fruition. Peace is the acme of ennobling enterprises, that overarching transformative goal. It is us, up to us to move that transformative goal to inevitable fruition. Let's remember Rosalind Carter's words. Great leaders take people where they don't necessarily want to go, but ought to be. Let's also remember that Peter Drucker understood that the true value of leadership was the identification of a noble transformative goal that changes the world for the better in some crucial way that engages others in that noble effort and that creates significance and meaning in the lives of those who do. And that means both leaders and their collaborators. Only then can different leadership strategies selected and orchestrated by an engaged and knowledgeable leader provide the vehicles that will take us to that life-altering, world-changing destination. In sum, it's not about the leader. Rather, first and foremost, it's about the identifying the transformative goal. And only then do the appropriate and potentially multiple strategies come into play. Leadership we now see is actually considerably more complex and subtle than most students of leadership have previously realized. I hope that you here today also agree that leadership, when it's no longer misunderstood, can truly transform the world. And finally, my last question, I think Confucius would agree, uh, is what will it take for you, each and every one of you, to do your part. Okay, thank you. <laughs>